that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you can start recording. Yeah, we're going to start here in a minute or two. I'm going to start in like a minute. Hey, Devin. Yep. <clears throat> oh, okay. Thank you. Well, you need more, maybe? Okay. Here, take this up just in case. exciting. I haven't talked about my stuff in a long, long time. Well, only to two people, but uh, I started 2009. So 2009 and graduated 2012. So it's been, it's been a little while. Uh, there's more pictures. There's a lot of pictures. <clears throat> so it's not really heavy into like, oh, here's all these equations. It's more about experience and then show you what we talked about and some results. So, so how many more are out there? Quite a bit? Getting pizza? Okay. We'll start here soon. See how it's going. Uh oh, I pulled the pin. <laughs> That's what it's going to be now. There we go. Hello. All right. Uh, I'll get started here, Shane. Pretty person okay I'm gonna put two here okay Oh, that's fine. Yeah. No, that's okay. Oh, it'll be done. Yeah. At 12:45, I'll kind of stop and. Yeah. All right. We can get started. Um, okay. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, so. I just wanted to kind of talk to you to give you my experience during my PhD and uh, I'll go through some of the places that I visited, uh, some of the experiences, what I did for work and uh, stuff that I was actually looking for during my PhD and some results, okay? 
So you'll see pictures that, uh, you'll see a picture of this and this just to show you that I didn't just work, which you shouldn't always work. You should have some fun if you're going somewhere. So I'll talk about all that. And uh, just, I just put these on here because when I was doing my PhD, a lot of the committee members that were part of my committee weren't just at Clarkson, okay? Because that's where I grad, I'll talk about that, but I graduated at Clarkson, okay? <clears throat> these two were at Clarkson, actually these three, and then Bruce and Dave, Bruce was at NASA and Dave was at NCAR, and I'll talk about what those acronyms are in a second. So I had, it was a really a good challenge for me to really get the industry leaders that are working on this stuff now to help me, all right? So just a quick background, I actually grew up in Carthage, so it's like an hour and a half from here in 2002. I went to JCC in 2004, graduated, and then I transferred right up to Clarkson and got my aeronautical degree, my master's degree, and PhD, all right? Um, and uh, basically what you're going to see is mostly everything that I did during my PhD and all the places that I got to visit. If you have a question, just go ahead and ask. Um, right then, okay, don't worry about raising your hand, just ask if you have a question. There's gonna be lots of pictures. So this is basically all the places I got to visit uh, and did a whole bunch of field campaigns. So here's Carthage, and uh, the first part I'm gonna talk about is my internship in Colorado. Then these three are what they call field campaigns, where we uh, go and bring an airplane and fly around looking at clouds, and I'll talk about all that stuff. So Peoria, I was stationed there for three and a half months, and PLOWS was the acronym standing for Profiling of Winter Storms, okay? And then you, we, I then went to GRIP with NASA, and we were stationed out of Fort Lauderdale, and we're actually looking at the pre-stages before a hurricane, okay? Like what is develop, how, do you, how does a hurricane develop from a tropical storm to a hurricane, okay? And then the last field campaign I went was in St. Croix. So that was my first time in a nice, warm, humid, hot place. So that was quite interesting. But we were looking at ice in the middle of summer in clouds. Okay? Um, so it was really cool. So let's take it back, way back in time. Okay? 2009. So back in May 2009. I don't know what many people were doing in 2009. <laughs> Graduate high school. Okay. So I was a fresh PhD student, and I was getting ready to do an internship in Colorado. All right, so I was pretty nervous. I mean, I didn't have very good social skills, which now I do from this experience. And I had to go meet this guy, which I've never met before. I only heard over the phone. I had no idea what he looked like, okay? Um, so, and I've only been on an airplane twice. Okay, before I actually went to here, All right, which is kind of ironic because everything I did for my PhD, I was on an aircraft flying around. Okay, so I'll talk about all that. So I was in the Denver airport. I didn't know he had a sign it said Lucas Craig from Clarkson. I was like, okay, this is the guy. All right, and picture he was wearing. Uh, he wasn't wearing this, but he's wearing like a pink shirt with green neon shorts. I was like, yes, this is the guy that I want to be working with me, okay? It was, it was nice. So Dave Rogers, he's actually one of uh, probably the best mentor that I ever had. Um, he really knew what he was doing and helped me a lot. So here is <clears throat> from the airport to Boulder, okay? Because we're going to the, the, uh, the internship paid for my airplane ticket and the room and board for the whole summer, okay? And I'm going to talk about what we did. I'm going to show you some pictures of things I've done for fun, and then we'll get right into the work. This was pre-smartphone, okay? Actually, the iPhone, the first iPhone came out that summer, that May, I think, but I did not have $500 to spend on, okay? So I had a flip phone, and these were taken from those button-pushing cameras that many people probably don't have, okay? So this is coming in, pictures of the mountains. This is really cool. Actually, can I turn... The light off. There we go. Is that all right? Is that better? Okay. Uh, this right here was buildings where kind of Dave worked at. 
So what I was doing in internship was for NCAR, which stood for National Center for Atmospheric Research. Okay? They're basically like NASA, but they're the a university side of learning. So NASA is the government side. So I could tell you there's a huge difference. Okay? NASA, you get the stuff, you give it to me, we'll get the results and give it back. There was a little bit of learning, but not as much as NCAR. Okay? NCAR was university-based. They wanted you to learn the stuff. Okay? That was my experience between the two. Uh, here is just an apartment. I, I didn't know Boulder at all, so I got a map. Um, and then I found some really good places to eat. Uh, the Walnut Brewery was really good. Mountain Sun had really good hamburgers. And then this right here was an Ethiopian place. Anybody ever eaten at an Ethiopian place? You have, you have, okay. They have no utensils. They didn't have any tables. It was like you sit on the floor around these little round barrels and you dipped this bread into your food, okay? So when we get, I was with my lab mates when we first did this. We come in, I had no idea how to eat it. The lady comes, she's like, let me show you how to eat it. And I was like, sure. So she grabs the piece of bread, rips it apart, grabs a piece of meat and sticks it right in my mouth without even, like I had no response time. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> um, and then my lab mates are like, yeah, we know how to eat. Don't, don't worry about us. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's great. But it was really good. It was very good. So my wife did come to visit in Colorado. Anybody know who this is? No one watches Top Chef. Okay. So he, he was a winner. He lives in Boulder. He has a, it's called Jack Fish House in Boulder. And we went to go eat there. Um, he was our favorite Top Chef winner. So just side note. Um, downtown Boulder, they had a lot of different people doing a whole bunch of cool activities. This guy was flinging knives up, doing uh, uh, crazy stunts. There was a guy there that would lay out the United States. And you would tell him where you, like, say Canton. He would know the zip code. He would know the zip codes of every city in the United States. So he would ask the audience, and you say, "Okay, where you live?" You grab them, bring them to the spot in the United States, and then after he grabbed like ten people, he'd go through the zip codes. So it was really cool to see that. Uh, we actually went and did some whitewater rafting, um, so that was pretty funny. That um, so that was our first time. Okay, so I had fun, but let's get back to what I was there for. All right. So I went there to start studying about how to measure aerosols in air, okay? Aerosols being really, really small particles that you can't see with your naked eye that form into clouds, okay? So pollen, dust, uh, you name it, okay? It's, they're really, really tiny, and I'll show you kind of the scale between that and a cloud. Why were we doing it? Well, this, this graph right here shows you in... Uh, 2007 <clears throat> for basically your climate change. So the red indicates, here we have CO2, it's heating the air, okay, for global climate. Where aerosols down here, they notice that there's a cooling effect, okay? So overall, the temperature has been rising, okay, throughout the years since the Industrial Revolution. And <clears throat> some of it contributes, like CO2 will warm, but We've been noticing that aerosol particles, certain ones, will actually cool it, so keep it cooling. So we wanted to study it better. The other reason was we know the weather predictions are not very good, right? But they're getting better, and we were trying to develop a new instrument that would measure particles inside clouds. And I'll, I'll talk about that some more later. So here's just a picture of different types of clouds. Uh, you have cumulus you have your stratus and you have your cirrus clouds, okay? So cirrus are up here, they're pretty much ice. Your cumulus are basically those poofy ones you have. And then your stratus clouds are really those long ones you see when you look up, you can't really see the ends, okay? And uh, so just to give you a little idea of cl some cloud basics. <clears throat> How is a cloud formed? Well, let's look over here. Basically, the easiest way to think about it is these black circles are particles, okay? It could be pollen, it could be dust, any type of part particles, okay? And they're in this air mass at the ground, and it rises up, and it hits a certain point 
which is the, the uh, liquid condensation level, and it gets, it's colder as it goes up, this air mass, and then it finally the water vapor in the air cools on these particles and forms clouds. Okay, so that's the basic idea of how clouds are formed. And there are, over here, if we take an air mass on the ground and there's, I don't know how many are here, three, four, 12 particles, when a cloud is formed, not all of them absorb water. Some of them don't. Okay, so here we have four particles that didn't. Okay, so we were trying to measure these particles here when we're sampling through clouds. Okay, to understand why these didn't form into clouds, what, is, what are these particles? And uh, they're called interstitial particles because they're in between the cloud droplets. And uh, so that was our goal. Okay, and I'll explain later why the current aerosol inlets, and I'll talk about that in a second, they weren't working to measure the part, those type of particles. So here's a comparison of between an interstitial particle, a small cloud droplet, large cloud droplet, and a precipitation. Okay, there's two scale but only to each other. Okay, so you can't see these, right? Because they're really, really tiny. And then haze particles, when you look in the sky sometimes, it's hard to see through. That's what the haze is. And then you have small, which is 2 to 50 micron. Large is 50 to 500. And your participation is basically 500 to 4,000. Okay, and that's when you start seeing like rain, snow, and they start falling. So just to get an idea of basically the sizes, a spider web is 2 to 3 micron, sea salt, a dot, 615 micron. So you have an idea of the size we're looking at. Really, really tiny, right? Really tiny. Um, so I went to, to this place, NCAR, to understand how aerosols worked in the air, what type of instruments were used to sample those, and I have a picture here coming up. And the, the main purpose was to uh, get ready for plows coming that was going to happen in uh, November. So I need to learn about all the different types of aircraft components that are on the aircraft because we were going to fly up and go study these clouds. Okay. So here's a picture of the C-130, just a side view. Uh, they converted that from a military plane to a research plane. Here is the back end without any instruments in. Okay, so every field campaign they did, they would strip everything out, make sure everything was good to go, and then we would put these instruments in. Here, here's the back end. <clears throat> so we were going to look at these, what they call aerosol inlets. What are they? Well, it's basically a tube where the air comes in, and then this sample goes right to the aircraft cabin. Okay, so basically... It'll go to whatever instrument you have inside the plane. So we would fly, the air would come in here, go right to the cabin, and then we had other instruments that would measure what type of particle it was and the size of those particles. This also, some of them will have shrouds just to make sure that the flow coming in is straight coming in here. And here's a couple pictures of different inlets. So this one is very similar to this. It has a shroud and then it has this... Uh, probe. Here are just nine, uh, just angled tubes stick out, and we have plastic little tubes that come out through the center. And then these are some of the ones that I looked at and try to help design. This this one right here and this one uh, we actually designed and we were actually testing to see if those would actually work better to measure particles in clouds than not. And then this one and this one were already designed but didn't have any analysis. They, didn't, they had data, but they didn't, didn't look at the data yet. And to come to find out, these cones are the same thing. We just made multiple inlets actually perform very well inside clouds. And I'm going to show you why by the end of this. So just to give you some information, and I have some pictures later, what we need to look at when we're going through clouds is you have a CDP, which is a cloud droplet probe, that measures the 2 to 50 micron range, which is this blue. And what you're seeing here is number, the number of particles in a cubic centimeter. Okay, so in one cubic centimeter, there's, at this time, you have a lot, like two or 300 of these cloud droplets. So there's a lot of cloud droplets. 
Over here, this dotted uh, green is over here. That's the uh, large power droplets. Okay. So typically, you have a lot less. Like, look, this is to the one, right? So there's a lot less bigger particles, but a lot of smaller particles. Okay. So this is clouds. And then down here is basically inlets, inlet information. Okay. So you see this red one? This is typically what they've always been using on an aircraft to measure particles in air. So over here, I'm going to talk about this here in a second, what this is. But these two inlets are the same of value. But in clouds, what happens? This one actually goes up by a lot. And this one goes down. Okay? And then this is after the cloud. So these are all lined up, if you notice, with the cloud. So after the cloud, these two start measuring particles correctly. So this E is basically the measurement from its inlet the number of particles, okay, over a background number. So the background number is before and after the cloud. Okay, does that make sense? So if we have 100 here, then this would be 100. But in the clouds, you notice that this ratio, this enhancement, is large for this one. Okay, anybody want to guess why? What do you think happens when you squeeze a sponge and a water droplet hits the table. It splatters, right? What happens when a cloud droplet comes straight like this, it hits the wall here, break up, and it's going to come in. So instead of measuring the correct number, we measure an enhancement. That's why I define this as an enhancement. But look at this one, this inlet right here. What happens to that one? It actually doesn't create an enhancement. It's not getting those splash or shatter artifacts. Okay? And we wanted to know why, and that was a big part of my research. Okay? It was to go through all these campaigns with these inlets to see why it works. Um, so what type of breakup can you have? Well, here's a cross-sectional area of, of this cone right here. Well, <clears throat> the first thing is these black dots represent aerosol particles. We could say they're before clouds or after. Okay? Now we come into clouds. You have all these different shapes, and uh, the first thing you can get is wall impaction. So this droplet comes in, hits a wall, and splatters. You will, there is, that happens, there is a case where some of these are small enough they can make this bend and go right into the cabin. It happens, okay? There's nothing you can do about that. But majority of these go over this way and don't go into the sample tube that we need. Another breakup is what they call aerodynamic breakup, meaning this large droplet comes into a region where it has to slow down, and it slows down too fast and shears and rips apart. And that's what they call aerodynamic breakup. But you could also get a film buildup on the wall, and that film will then spray off. All right, and each, this one's actually pretty difficult to determine. But this one and this one have certain equations that I, I'm not going to talk about, but certain equations to say, yeah, if it hits this wall at this speed, it's going to break up. Or if this comes in and decelerates too fast at this rate, it'll break up. Okay? So there are values, and that's, that's kind of what I looked at. So here are all the inlets that I kind of looked at initially to see, okay, which one was working good, which one didn't work good. All right? And... Uh, <clears throat> These ones down here are all ones that did not work good. They are horrible, okay? And these two up here actually worked very well. They're called flow restriction inlets, meaning, and I have a contour later on to show you that, the flow coming in here inside this slows down enough and doesn't create this breakup. It's really, really cool, all right? <clears throat> So we needed to first design the inlet, understand how these inlets are working, okay? But we also needed to, for us at Clarkson, design the instruments to measure those particles and bring them into the cabin. So my duties were design this. This was the flow control unit to control the flow in our instrument that we needed. Okay, and I have a picture of where this was using, okay? But I wanted to show you this because this was the second iteration over two and a half years. 
Okay. Inside this box was a blower that went from zero to 100 liters per minute for air circulating. <clears throat> Here you had the flow meter to control this flow. You had fans, voltage source, zero to 10,000 volts. And uh, that we had to be very careful because when we, sh we needed to send like eight, 9,000 volts to this instrument, and uh, we had to make sure it wasn't going to arc. So we had to make sure everything was insulated. All these wires are f wa uh, fireproof. That was a mandatory thing. Um, on an aircraft, you have to be fireproof. So we had to be really, really careful. This was the uh, power supply to control all these sensors. You had a pressure sensor here. You had, uh, I had relative humidity. I had a whole bunch of temperature sensors to measure temperature. All right. So where did this go? Well, we we're eventually going to put it inside the cabin. Here's a picture of inside the cabin. <clears throat> here is my mentor here helping. <clears throat> and uh, this is our, this is the back view. And then here is the front view of all the instruments that we had to put in the aircraft. Okay. See this? That was that box I just showed you. All right. That was controlling the flow in this little uh, rocket right here. Okay, it wasn't a rocket. Basically, it's a cylinder inside another cylinder. And as the, air, the particles come into this, they're between those two cylinders, a, there's a flow that goes straight down, and we apply a high voltage to the center. And that attracts the particles towards the center. And that's why we needed the voltage. So there's a little gap at the very bottom that would capture the certain sizes that we need. And we can send those to these right here to actually measure the number of those sizes. All right. So that's what this is. This was a new design for that method. And that's what my lab mate designed. I needed to help him make sure I got the flow right going through there, control the voltage. And uh, these were standard instruments you could buy. They're like each one is probably $20,000. So <clears throat> looking at this, I bet you it was close to $250,000 worth of instruments. Okay, this was our first campaign. And this took a long time. So my internship at the, the last two weeks of August, I started helping put the instruments on the rack. Okay, we didn't fly this until the la beginning of November. So it took us all that time to put these in here. We had to do calculations to make sure the bolts that were attached here, if we hit hard when we landed, wouldn't pop out. All right. So there was a whole bunch of conditions that we needed to do. Here is my lab mate uh, just uh, helping some calibrations that he was doing. Here's some pictures that we took while we are doing a test flight. Um, it was really, really cool. I got to go up to the pilots because this is not a commercial flight, so we can do whatever kind of... I can go up there, put the headsets on, and listen. I couldn't talk back to them. There was a mute button, but um, so that was cool. Uh, here is my first test flight. If you notice, these are puke bags. So our first test flight went two hours, and I puked the whole time. <laughs> okay? I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I'm like, I got... There's gonna, there was planned to be 20 field campaign flights, and they were going to be four to eight hours long. I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Um, anybody know the remedy, the natural remedy to help motion sickness? Uh, no, that would have made it worse for sure. <laughs> ginger. So ginger root and ginger pills I was taking every two hours. And it helped. Um, it helped. It helped. So I had hair back then too. Um, okay, so that covered kind of my internship to pre-plows, okay? So uh, some of these I'll go kind of fast. So Peoria, Illinois, anybody been there? No, it's actually the home of Caterpillar. So I didn't know that until I landed. But uh, here's the hotel I stayed at for three and a half months. That was a long time in a hotel. Actually, I was at the hotel longer than the airplane because the airplane had a lot of issues, so they had to send it back to Colorado to get it fixed and back. So, um, so that was fun. So here's Peoria. Here's Chicago. So I definitely went to Chicago. I've never been to Chicago. So I went to have deep dish pizza. That was really good. And there was a building there that you can stand out and look through. I don't remember the building name, but it's a famous building. But that was pretty 
That was kind of scary. Anybody ever been there? If you go to Chicago, go to this building. It's, I mean, we're outside. Like, we're looking straight through the glass. Okay, so this was the aircraft, uh, the C-130. So that's what we're using. It's just the front view, side view. And then here are outside. Uh, these are right here. And then this one around the wingtips. Okay, but we had a whole bunch of other ones on the other side too. So let's, I think I'll have some slides to talk about how these worked. So here is the inside of the cabin when we were uh, finished with all the instruments. <clears throat> here are those inlets again. Uh, I took a whole bunch of pictures throughout this to make sure I had them. So we were testing these three during plows. It shattered. Huh? Uh, so here's just a pilot picture. One of the flights we were doing actually uh, made the, this was the front window of one of the pilots. It cracked because the temperature distribution was too much. So they heard a big bang and I heard it over my headset. I was like, oh man, what was that? It was just the window being cracked. So that was fun. Um, so they had to take that back to Colorado for the plane. Um, another couple flights, the one of the engines stopped working, so they had to take that back. And then the last time they had to get it fixed was one of the, well, they could hear, and these, these mechanics were really good. Yeah, I couldn't tell the difference, but they could hear a whistling in one of the motors. Come to find out, it was a prop that was being unbalanced. So it took them a long time to diagnose that, but they finally got that. And then they had to actually go out and order one, and then they had to make it, and then ship it back. So... It was, a, it was a fun time. So what would we do? Well, we would uh, pick a cloud, fly through it, and uh, we would get images from the cloud probes. Okay? So you have liquid, then you have grapple, which is a mix of liquid and water, or ice, and then you get snowflakes. I mean, that one looks like a tiger. Um, that was pretty cool. So I spent many hours, many, I would say many months, looking at this to see which one was liquid and snow and ice. So here are the uh, 2 to 50 micron probes. So the way these worked is the air came through these two like sections here, okay? And there was a laser beam that got shot across. And as the particle comes through here, it scatters some light. And that light was then captured by these sensors here. And then there is a whole bunch of equations they use, depending on the intensity, figure out what the size of it was and the number. Okay. Well, the uh, oops, sorry, the uh, 50 to 6.5 millimeter range, you had these 2DP for participation, 2DC for cloud droplets, large ones. Very similar. Cloud comes in here, but they actually scan and get images. All right. So here's a liquid and snowflakes, and then here's some ice. All right, I mean, it's pretty crazy what these things can do. A new instrument that one of the groups were testing was a holographic 3D image of a raindrop or snowflake, and that was crazy amount of data. Four hours, I think it was three or four terabytes of data. Okay, so it was just mind-boggling how much information they could get with that. So uh, for plows, there were 17 total flights. And on my computer, this is what I could do. I could look forward, down, look at the instruments inside the bottom of the aircraft. Here is, uh, this I actually took from GRIP. This was a hurricane. And this is us right here, the blue. And we were actually flying around the hurricane looking at, uh, well, this is actually the Global Hawk, which was the UAV. And that was being flown in California. So that was pretty cool. We had chat, and then this is the data that we look at. So these were typical things that I would look at on my computer during the flights. Uh, typically four to ten hours long. This girl was shooting a Pringles can out of the bottom of the airplane. Inside the Pringles can was temperature, pressure, relative humidity, GPS sensors. Okay? And it would actually profile the atmosphere as it went down. And uh, so here's her putting it in here. So it was like a toilet. kind of flushed it and it fell right through, and then real time she could look at what the pressure was, what the temperature was, the relative humidity, it was really, really cool. And I sat right next to her, because my stuff was over here. 
Nope. They typically only did it over water, but for plows, we were flying over abandoned areas, and we got approval for that. But typically, they don't do that. Yep. Um, so one of my goals was to capture everyone sleeping. Okay, so there was a lot of people sleeping. <laughs> All right, so that was kind of cool. Um, I'll skip that. Um, I'm just going to skip these and keep, can you keep going because I think we're, we're doing pretty good. So now I was done with plows and uh, finally it was my time because I got a scholarship through NASA to work with NASA. So that was based out of Fort Lauderdale. So here's the DC-8. It was a jet plane. Uh, this was a lot bigger than the C-130, a lot less um, noisy and it was warmer. Okay, the C-130 was really loud, really cold, and uh, made me throw up many times. Um, here's inside the plane, uh, just to give you an idea. I was sitting like right here where I took the picture, and here you actually had two NASA people helping out to making sure everything was working right. They wore the jumpsuits, so that was pretty cool to see. Here is our instrumentation. I did not do any of this prep. We just sent our stuff to them, and they did it for us. Um, that's the difference between NCAR and NASA. They kind of do everything. Here was my uh, mentor at NASA. This is Bruce. And uh, here's Eddie. He was the uh, technician, uh, basically running everything with me. See that? Would you ever have an open container on an airplane? No. NASA doesn't care which is weird. NCAR, the, the biggest requirement was no open containers. Okay, and I can tell you why. We weren't even in a hurricane. We we're flying to the hurricane and we hit an air pocket, a big air pocket. And the plane went this and dropped so really, really fast. And they didn't give us enough warning because they didn't see it coming. We didn't have our seat belts on. And I didn't have an open container, but the person next to me did on the other side. And uh, uh, we f all flew up in our seats. And I look over, and uh, this gentleman over here was really short and tiny, and he hit the ceiling. And uh, he had an open container, and it went all over. So that was a kind of a cool experience to see. Um, uh, and it wasn't even in the hurricane. So here was uh, 11 research flights for NASA. Uh, here, this was the inlet that we were testing. That's what NASA used. They were massive. And these ones did not work. I mean, they threw the data away when they measured inside clouds. But ours, we could actually now use the data. So it was pretty cool. Again, these are just instruments that we had. Um, this was inside a Category 4 hurricane that I got to go. And my second flight with NASA. Um, so it was really cool. I missed the first day because my paperwork wasn't ready. And that was my fault. So key thing. Make sure your paperwork is done when you do this stuff. Here is uh, just an image over St. Croix. So uh, we actually got to, I actually got to land in St. Croix before going to St. Croix, but I didn't know that at the time, so that was pretty cool. Uh, I'll skip that too. So that's grip. That was working with NASA. My last one and favorite one was going to St. Croix because I was finally, this was 2011, I was being a mentor, I was teaching a new student to come and take over for me. Um, so that was really cool. Here's a C-130, so I, so I worked with Nat, or NCAR for plows, worked with NASA, and now I'm back with NCAR. All right, looking at those same inlets again. So the name of it was Ice T. So my friend, my person I was mentoring was really good at Photoshop, so uh, he made Ice T, okay? Here is the hotel that we got to stay at. Loved it. Uh, not only did they pay for the hotel, but they paid for my per diem for food, which was $92 a day. So we went to Walmart, spent $10 a day, and we could actually bank money, and we didn't have to declare it on taxes, so it was really cool. Uh, I was there for a whole month, so that was a good chunk of change that I needed. But there was a, it was a gated hotel, and I didn't know this through halfway, but they thought I was Seth Rogen. They thought I looked like Seth Rogen, so... I don't know, it was, they thought I was a celebrity, which was kind of weird. Um, here is downtown in St. Croix where the restaurants were, so we could eat right on the beach or the, the island here. It was really nice. So here for iced tea was 10 research flights, 
And uh, these were the inlets that you talked about before, I talked about. But look, we doubled the amount of instruments that we used from plows. <laughs> That's what happens <laughs> when you do another one for the same company. Um, this took three to four months to put everything in. We had instruments on the top. They normally don't do that, all right? Um, so we were doing everything. I mean, it was, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of fun. There was a group of us, five to six of us, that would go in at seven o'clock in the morning and we wouldn't stop working until seven, eight o'clock at night. Okay, we did that for months, all right? And this was, we, where we had a prep was back in Colorado. So we had to go back to Colorado and do all that stuff before going to St. Croix. So that was fun. Here was a guy just testing some filters. So he would stick this tube into a filter um, and get filter samples from the, one of the inlets, take them back out. All right, so results. We're doing good on time. Remember, clouds, how they're formed. You, needed, you need particles, and when it rises up, it condenses the water vapor onto a particle. So some of these particles don't form into clouds, and uh, that's what we wanted to sample. We wanted to know what these were and sample those. And remember that there's an enhancement that we need to talk about, okay? So here are the results that I plotted after <clears throat> some of the data. Over here, that's with this type of inlet. The flow comes in kind of straight, and look, it's all greater than one. That's bad, really bad. You don't want those, right? Because it's creating these splash artifacts. Where look over here, this one, all these are pretty much below. There's still a little bit, but there is an increased trend, right? So we do notice that this isn't perfect, but it's, it's much better than that. Now, you see the, so the color is by, is by like number concentration. So the higher the number concentration, the enhancement should be lower, right? Because if you, if you are uh, increasing the number of particles um, forming before a cloud or after a cloud, you could look at that relationship, okay? But the bottom line, the biggest thing you want to get out of this is this inlet much measure inside clouds and get the correct number for particles where this one is just, they don't do it, okay? So when I started doing this research, they would throw all the data away inside clouds because it would always get this. Now they can finally get the data inside clouds and hopefully in the future they can have better weather predictions because they can figure out what those cloud droplets are that aren't forming in the clouds, which eventually will help the equations they use for weather predictions. Um, here is a result from this same inlet here, but in ice. So the graph you saw before was just warm clouds. Here you have ice. Ice was a little bit tricky. Okay, I think I have a little bit of images of some of these different types. I mean, there's so many shapes that could be formed for ice that it's just almost impossible to really decipher in ice. Okay, but I wanted to show you that I had a look at ice too and kind of give an idea um, what happens. So why does it work? Well, here is a velocity contour of what's happening around the inlet. So the aircraft is flying way up here at pretty much uh, about, say, 120 meters per second. So as the flow comes in to the inlet, what happens? The velocity decreases. Okay? The airspeed decreases. Okay? So if you have a cloud droplet coming in, what's it going to do? It's going to decrease okay it's going to slow down and when it slows down it could avoid a wall right because if you're running full speed you can't really control where you're running right but if you slow down you can go and make a corner or do what you need to okay so that's why these are called flow restriction inlets because they decrease the flow upstream of the inlet so a cloud drop that can come in slow down and go around the walls or whatever okay there's a certain limit where it doesn't do that, okay? but the basic idea comes from that. The sample tube is also perpendicular to the flow direction, okay? which helps because you don't get the large particles coming in and then actually breaking up anywhere inside the tube. Okay? And there is a lip right around here that helps any, uh, if the water sticks to the tube under here, it won't come up and go in the tube. It goes around the lip. 
So that was the basic reason why that inlet was working and performing. Um, so this was a hypothetical shape. After all, this was my last slide that I actually showed in my dissertation. An idea of the best way you should design if you want to measure inside clouds. You have a cone shape here where you have these blunt bodies to help reduce the flow upstream. You have this perpendicular sampling tube with a really cool lip. And back here, if you pinch the flow and the pinch the flow here, it would actually reduce the flow upstream too. So there's two alternatives to do that. Um, so this, this was my hypothetical idea of what you should do. What we found out was, we tested this, we pinched this pretty much almost to nothing. Okay? The flow speed really reduced a lot. But what happened was these large cloud droplets, 30 micron, actually were able to bend and come in because the flow dropped too much. And now what's going to happen? You're going to get break up inside the sample tube and then you're... So there's a limit that we have to figure, that we... St I still haven't figured out exactly. That's, I have actually Paul and Inder are working on uh, capstone on uh, kind of identifying some shapes that are going to get the right velocities kind of thing. So. Um, so in summary, I did not have very good social skills. Okay, So I worked on that. That was good. So soft skills, uh, I became more social. I could actually talk to people if I had questions on, I mean, this was, I had no idea when I left Carthage, going to Colorado, what, anything. I mean, I didn't know where I was. I didn't have the smartphones you guys have now. And I'm, okay, I need to go to Walmart. I had no idea, all right? Um, how to handle situations. I ate out a lot. Getting the right tip is really important. Uh, so I learned, okay, you don't give someone a dollar if they're doing a good job, you know what I mean? So I learned how to interact with people and learn the correct way to do things, okay? So um, I think that was it. So questions? Questions. And so in five minutes or whatever, I do, hopefully everyone got a ticket. Um, if you didn't get a ticket, let us know. But I'll draw, I have two $25 gift cards for coming, so yes? So as you decrease the velocity, pressure will increase. So the higher the pressure, it's kind of pushing against the upstream, so it's causing the particles to slow down. Okay, so the pressure does the pressure and velocity interact together. Okay. Um, but yes, so if you had to figure out what size droplets would actually make the bend and come in there, yes, you had to do all that stuff. Yes. Yep, it would change it. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, with regards to the location of your breeze sensor, I can only estimate that there were um, four um, properties. Would it, would it change them from the property or affect um, the, um, your... That's a, so the question he's asking is, where are you placing these inlets on the plane? OK. Yes, we've done studies. We did all of ours on the belly except for NASA. They were on the side. Okay? So we had to make sure when we put this on that there were no instruments above or upstream where we put it. Otherwise, yes, it would cause it. Okay? Typically, the best location would be way upstream by the pilots on the side so you wouldn't get any turbulence from the motors. Okay? We did a study where, we're, where our inlets were placed on the belly and the back. We're fine. The, the, the biggest concern with being on the belly was the length of the inlet because it can't be too long. Otherwise, when you land, it'll sh snap right off. Okay? So we had to make sure we were in that region. But yeah, those are good, very good questions. Yep, we, we, we had to check all those. So, yes, Tyler. Uh, what was your flight path? Always just fly straight? Uh, no, we would, sometimes they would want to profile like a cumulobus cloud. So we would actually kind of do like a circle like this. 
Um, sometimes we would hit a cloud at the top, the middle, and the bottom. So it all depended on what the project director wanted to do. I was just there to get as much data as possible, so I didn't care what we did. Um, just don't make me puke. <laughs> yes? Were you afraid when you were above the hurricane? No, I wasn't. We were 30,000 feet up, I forgot. There was, so we were so high up that it was very little turbulence. However, um, trying to think of the, uh, there was another company, NOAA, so NOAA does the weather predictions. They had their airplane too, but they are crazy. They fly five to 8,000 feet off the ocean floor to sample these. So the, it was the P, P some, P3 airplane, and they called it the puke plane because everyone puked, even the veterans puked because it was so bumpy. But yeah, I wasn't worried, I was so far up. It, it was a little turbulence, but nothing major, so. Uh huh. Yep. Because the company we bought it for didn't design it right, and there's leaks. <laughs> they didn't design it for our application. So when we were flying up in the air, the pressure was uh, 200 millibars, 300 millibars, which is like significantly lower than atmospheric pressure. So any air would come right into that, and we would contaminate it. So we put it in the box, sealed it, and made sure there was no leaks. We, and I come to find out the company we bought it for, I didn't realize when I bought it first, was from Colorado. And uh, so we finally talked to them, and they designed a better one. Now it's a better one in there that doesn't leak. So, yep. OK, let's, uh, let's draw these. Um, it doesn't have a ticket that wants one, I guess. OK. All right, so get your tickets out, and we'll draw them out of a hat. And thank you. Yeah. We, we couldn't because we didn't have the instrument, but other teams, they had a mass spectrometer. They could bring the particle in and do what I, and determine what type of particle it was. Yep. yep. All right. So first one, I have to draw two. Uh, one, four, three, two, nine, two. Oh, no way. Okay, that wasn't rigged, I promise. Uh, one, four, three, three, zero, nine. There it goes. Okay, come up here to claim your ticket. All righty, here you go. go. Thank you. Thank you. If you have more questions, let me know. There you go. $25 gift card. What was that one? Huh? 309? Yeah, I'm pretty sure.